In the 50 years that I've been a woodworker, I've mostly considered myself a power tool woodworker, as many woodworkers today do. Although there's still a small group of woodworkers who focus on doing things with hand tools. Now woodworking, of course, had its start with hand tools. There were no power tools back in the 1800s or 1700s or even farther back. No, everything was done by hand power. Uh, there were a few shops that used animal power. Uh, it, there are still examples today of old um, power tools that were animal driven. There'd be a, a windlass outside with animals walking around, connected to a shaft going overhead in the, in the shop and leather belts that came down to provide power to the tools. Now, those are the earliest of the power tools. And there's actually a couple shops still in existence that are operating that way. And they're mostly doing it more as a historical uh, remembrance than anything else. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about you and me and what we do with our woodworking. Now, as I said, I've mostly considered myself a power tool woodworker, as many people do. But I've always used some, some hand tools. And as I've grown in my woodworking, I found more and more reason to use hand tools. Now, that may sound a little backwards, but there's just times when it's easier to do it with a hand tool. There's times I can pick up a, a handsaw and make a cut I need to do faster than I can set up the same cut on my table saw. There's times when using a chisel is the only way I'm going to get uh, a, a joint shaped perfectly, a, as accurately as I need to. There are real times for using hand tools. Planes. Planes have uh, always been a big part of woodworking and in some ways are are symbolic of woodworking, and yet there, uh, there's, there are many woodworkers that never touch a plane, yet there are plenty of places where a plane is a very useful tool, even today. Uh, some woodworkers today, uh, specifically that do reproduction pieces or even repair to antique furniture, might have a, a whole wall that's just covered with planes that are specialty planes, because there are literally thousands of types of specialty planes for doing moldings. Uh, architectural moldings that we find in our homes, which are done by machine now, were once done with special planes made by the carpenter uh, so that he could cut those planes and he could, uh, or he could cut those moldings to use in the buildings he was building. Well, I don't go that far, and, uh, but I do use planes. And, and I have found that there's a real value in knowing how to use power tools and hand tools both. So what I want to do for the next several minutes is talk about hand tools, specifically the categories that we're going to find the most useful in our woodworking. Uh, there's several I want to introduce you to, and I'll show you a little bit about how to use them uh, under the assumption that, like most woodworkers, you've probably not used them a whole lot. And so let's, let's look at these tools and let's look at what they can do for us and why we might want to use them in our own woodworking. Fine cuts with a saw are usually made with a back saw. Now, you can do it with different kinds of saws. I have two different back saws here. This is a Western style or American back saw. And by back, it means it's got this rib here which makes the, the saw stiffer, okay? It's not flexible. And uh, with the American style or Western style saw, the the saw cuts on the push stroke. That means the teeth are angled towards the front so that as I push forward, I'm getting my real cutting action, not coming back. When I'm coming back, I'm essentially clearing the sawdust out from the cut that I just made. A Japanese style saw uh, is canted so that the, the teeth are pointed back and it cuts on the pull stroke. Now, different people have different preferences and I have found that I prefer working with the Japanese style saw. And the main reason I prefer is that I get better control. Here's another thing you can do for control and that's make yourself a little guide block. Now, there's a lot of different people that make guide blocks and they make them different ways. All this is is a little L cut out of oak. Now, some people will, will embed a magnet in this surface so when they set it up against there, that'll actually hold the blade in place. The blade is being held against the block. And that's actually a better design if you really want to make sure you're cutting accurately. Okay, um, why would you want to use a hand saw instead of a power saw to make a cut like this? Well, mostly because you're doing small stuff. You really can't, I mean, you can, but it's really not easy to cut, say, dovetails on a table saw. Okay, now uh, you've probably seen videos somewhere where people are cutting uh, finger joining on a table saw, and you can do it, but you can also do it by hand. Uh, there are times when I just need to cut something small, like if I'm doing a tenon, I may go ahead and and make my major cuts 
on the table saw, but then you've got a little bit of shoulder there. Uh, like if this was, if I was doing the tenon here, I may make the cut for, for this side and the, the reverse side, but then I've got to cut the shoulders here, and it's, I just find it's easier because we're only talking a half inch by a half inch. It's just easier to do it with a hand saw instead of set up my saw for those tiny, two little cuts. Okay, so there are times when it really makes sense to work with a handsaw to get the cuts you want. Now, you've got to decide for yourself which times you prefer using it, okay? But nevertheless, knowing how to use one, and really, believe it or not, it takes a lot to learn how to use a handsaw. Now, the reason I, I prefer the Japanese saw, I told you, is because of, I get better control. If you take a, a standard saw, just like you know what you imagine when you see a handsaw in your mind, uh, they're hard to control. I find I can't make a straight cut with one, and I've been doing this for a lot of years. Okay, why not? Well, partially because it's easier to guide it when you're pulling than when you're pushing. Okay, when you're pushing, I'm trying to guide the end that's already outside of the cut instead of the end that's coming into the cut. The other thing is that um, I can see that line. If I'm making my cut right here, the cut is, is, is visible to me. If I'm cutting some things uh, and I'm cutting on the push stroke, that line may not be visible. If I'm doing it with this saw and I'm cutting that, that line there, okay, I have a line on this side that I can see, but I can't see the line on this side. And by not being able to see the line on this side, I could be going off there and I don't even know it. Okay, and that'll eventually show up on, on the side that's closer to me, but not until I'm already off. So that, that's one time you might want to use a handsaw. Uh, I found that there are a number of times when you've just got small cuts to make, that makes a whole lot more sense to use a handsaw, especially in precision joinery. Pretty much anything that can be done with a power saw can be done with a handsaw. Just need the right kind of handsaw. And there are several kinds of handsaws available to us. Uh, again, I'm using a Japanese saw here. This is a two-sided saw. Uh, it's so Japanese, it's named DeWalt. Uh, there is an actual Japanese name for it, too. So I'm going to show you one of the trickiest things I can come up with to do with the hand saw, and that's I'm going to show you resawing a, a board. Now, I just have a piece of pine here, pine one by four, in my vise, and uh, uh, I'm going to go in ahead and attempt, I notice I say attempt, to resaw this. Uh, I've never actually done this before because I do this on other tools. But what if you don't have those other tools? So they used to do this all by hand. And in some cases with larger boards, it'd be two men using a large saw. But I'm going to go ahead and, and I've drawn on a line on my board so I know to follow. So I've got lines all the way around. So I'm going to start on this side and I'll cut as far as I can using the line here and the line here. Then I'm going to turn it around, okay? So let's see what, how this goes. Okay, I've hit the point where I've, my saw has gotten to this corner, so I would be cutting down this side where I can't see the line. So I'm going to flip this around so I can always be cutting where I can see. Now, normally you're doing this with a larger board, and this would be sticking up higher. Uh, I'm just using a piece of, uh, of cutoff here, but the idea is the same. Okay, I'm still right on my line here. I've hit that corner over there, so I'm gonna flip it around again and pick up where I left off on this side. So you may not be able to see this on the camera, but I've come down about two inches on this side and about an inch and a half on this side. You know, I could keep going. I could get this cut all the way through but you probably get bored watching me, so I'm gonna call it quits right here. Another way you might find a handsaw more convenient than a power tool is if you're cutting tenons. Now, if you gotta do a lot of tenons, yeah, go ahead, set it up, do it on your table saw. But you know, there's four different setups you have to do on the table saw to cut a tenon. If you only gotta do one or two tenons, it's actually easier to use a back saw. And I'm gonna show you. So I've already marked this with a marking gauge. I realize you can't see my markings, but I've marked it so here, and, and around the edge so I know exactly where my cut's got to be. The other thing I'm using is a bench hook. Now a bench hook is about one of the simplest jigs you can make. It's just an L and a fence. And, and usually you just have one fence. I have two fences 
because I've made it so I can use it with push saws or pull saws. If I'm using a push saw, I would put the piece up against this fence. With the pull saw, I put the piece up against this, this fence. Same idea, okay? But I'm gonna start off with a piece in, in my uh, side chuck on my vise, on my side vise on my table. There's one cut. There's a total of, of eight cuts we gotta make here. Two cuts. And yes, there'd be eight cuts also if I was doing it on the table saw. Now I'm gonna turn it 90 degrees and make my other two cuts into the end here. And I'm just cutting right where my, my marking line was. And if you wonder what my other hand is doing there, my thumbnail is acting as a guide for my, my saw blade. Okay, so that's those four cuts. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put the bench hook into my vise. Uh, you don't necessarily have to put the bench hook into a vise, you can just hook it on the side of your bench. That just helps keep it from moving. And there we have a nice, nicely cut tenon. Now, if I was doing this for real, I would have cut just a touch off to the side of the line and then clean it up with a chisel. But I'd be doing the same thing whether I was cutting it with a hand saw or cutting with a table saw. And I'll have to say, doing that one tenon by hand was faster than doing the four setups on the table saw. If I was going to do a lot of tenons, yeah, it makes sense to do the table saw. If I'm just doing a couple, why not do them by hand? Chisels are one of the most versatile tools around and we can consider them to be probably the first, other than the knife, accurate tool out there, okay? Um, chisels come in a wide variety of styles. Uh, if you look at somebody that does all hand tool woodworking, they'll have so many chisels you won't even know what, how to identify them all. Now there's a lot of things that can be called chisels, like woodworking tools, I mean wood carving tools are actually chisels. Uh, we use chisels on the lathe. Uh, but what I'm referring to here are, are more basic chisels. And to me, they fall into two basic categories. Now there's more than these basic categories, but one is uh, a paring chisel, and that's a chisel that's designed to be used with hand force. And the way you can tell it's a paring chisel is there's no metal cap. It's not designed to be struck by something. It's hand pressure only, okay? The other would be a chisel with a metal cap, and this is for striking. And the other difference you'll notice between these two is that the, the, the chisel for, for striking, uh, what I think of as a mortising chisel, is thicker than the paring chisel, okay? And that's to withstand bending. Uh, a chisel like this, if you're pounding on a lot, you may actually bend or gradually bend the, the metal, okay? So, all right, now there's a lot of specialty chisels too, and there's a lot of, of different variety that I'm not getting into. I'm just trying to deal with this on a basic level here, okay? So, all right, so how do we use these? Well, let's start with, with pairing, all right? And pairing just means cutting shavings. Now, when I cut this tenon onto this board with a saw, I talked about cutting just shy of the line and then cleaning it up with a chisel. That's pairing, okay? If you look at this, and you probably can't see it, this face that's towards you of the tenon is actually not ver quite straight. It's a little bit off. So this is an ideal place to use a chisel to clean it up. And what I'm gonna do is set the chisel on there and I'm gonna take, I'm literally just taking shavings, okay? And my purpose here is to straighten up my cut. And at the same time, I'm gonna get a much smoother surface because the chisel itself uh, just provides, us, there's no, the cutting action of it doesn't cause the same problems uh, that a saw blade will. So I end up with a much, much cleaner cut. All right, so I, I can do, I can do a pairing on, on this surface. Uh, and yes, I know I'm striking, but notice I'm striking with the palm of my hand, not anything that's gonna damage the chisel. I, I can use pairing on the end of the tenon to, to square it up or maybe bring it right up to that line. But I can also use it on the shoulder here, okay? Uh, you might end up with some sawtooth marks in there and, and need to, to use a, a little bit of, of paring action to clean that up. Maybe this surface and this surface aren't quite level and you would need to use some paring 
to level that up. And you can, you can use a straight pressure or you can use a curving pressure, okay? It really just depends on, on what you're trying to cut. So I, I use these chisels. I can't say I use them all the time, but I use them fairly regularly. And I have a, and a set, so I have different sizes. Now, if you can't afford a whole set, buy yourself two sizes. Buy a quarter inch and three quarter inch because you'll be able to do most things with those two sizes, okay? My set ranges from a quarter inch up to an inch, and this is about a $100 set. So it's kind of a mid-grade set. It's not cheap junk, but it's not really, really fine, okay? So that's, that's one way I would use a, a pairing-type chisel, all right? Let me show you something else. I'm going to put... This is called a bench stop into my vise. And, and I could just put this on the side of the, the bench, but it works better to put it in the bench vise. So here's a, a half lap joint, okay? And I've cut this, uh, let's say I cut this on a table saw. Well, you're gonna end up with tooth marks from the table saw, okay? So I wanna, I'll wanna clean that up so I have a clean gluing surface. And this is another pairing type action. So I put my piece of wood, I can do it this way, I can do it this way, whichever angle works best. Put it up against that stop to hold it in place, and I can shave off the unevenness that happened from, from literally from cutting the half lap on the table saw, okay? And so this is a, a, a very common thing to do with a paring chisel, okay? Using the bench stop just keeps it from sliding away. I can't really put this in the vise, so I need it on the surface of my workbench, and, and having something that will, will stop that and keep it from going anywhere makes a huge difference. Now be careful that your chisel doesn't slip and catch that other hand, all right? That is one thing to be concerned about. All right, now for back here in this part of the, the lap, it's easy to use that forward pressure, but what about this outer edge? Well, now I need to come over here and block it up against the stop sideways so that I can make those shavings that are going towards the end. Okay, uh, you know, maybe you don't have a side vise on, on your table saw. Okay, I can do the same thing with a stop like this. This is just a piece of wood with two dowel rods that fit into the dog holes. Well, that dog hole's got a bunch of sawdust in it. All right. Well, anyway, normally it would fit into those two dog holes and I could run it up against there. The same idea, okay? Most people use this style just because it's easy. I can set it up there, use it, and take it out when I'm done. Okay, so now for using the mortising chisel, obviously I'm cutting a mortise. Now I just drew a mortise onto this same piece of wood just to work with. Now I'm working up against a bench stop again. And uh, so I don't have a mortising machine. So rather than using a mortising machine, mortising machine, I've cut a series of, uh, or drilled a, a series of holes in here. And now I can go ahead and cut this out uh, the rest of the way using chisels. And, and since I have a lot of material to take out, I actually don't want to go all the way to the edge of my cutout with the first cut. I'm going to go a little shy of it because the chisel doesn't go straight in. It's going to go at an angle actually that splits the difference between the two sides of that wedge. So the way I keep that from going where I don't want it to go is I minimize the amount of material I'm taking out on each cut. And, and I'm using a couple different sizes because this is too wide to go in this direction. And uh, this is why you need more than, more than one size. And this is why I was saying a three quarter inch and a one quarter is a pretty good combination. That's not what I'm using right now. I'm using a half inch and one inch because this particular mortise is actually a little bigger than what you would typically cut. Um, most mortises are, are an, a quarter inch wide. Okay, so I still haven't gone all the way out to my outer edge. Now we're going to do this again, getting really close to that outer edge. And, uh, and I'm really not striking it that hard. Uh, now how hard you strike it obviously is going to depend on several factors like how sharp your chisels are and how dense the wood is and uh, even how big a cutout you're trying to make. But this is, this is the morticing part of using chisels. And uh, 
this is why you need more than one kind of chisel. You, now, can you do pairing operations with these chisels? Yes, you can. But being thicker, it may be difficult to use them in some places. So, uh, wh why would you want to do a mortise if you're not doing mortise and tenon joiner? Well, if you ever try to put hinges or door lock into a door, you got to cut a mortise. So, mortises are actually much more common than just for mortise and tenon and joinery. It really depends on, on what all you're doing. There are a number of different types of hardware that require mortising to put them in. So, so this is where you need a, a, a heavier bodied chisel. So that it'll cut that out cleanly. Now they actually make a chisel that's uh, a 90 degree angle and it's for cutting out the corners uh, of a mortise. And uh, I don't have one, they're a little hard to find. They're a little bit on the expensive side. But if you do a lot of mortising, they're well worth having. So, so this, is, this is your other basic chisel operation. And, and as, as I mentioned, it takes a different kind of chisel, but that does the job. Planes come in all types. And for our purposes, we're really not going to get all the different types of molding planes and specialty planes that exist, and they can number in maybe even to the thousands. For the new woodworker, or relatively new woodworker, we can narrow planes down to uh, the regular bench plane, or some people refer to it as a jack plane, the block plane, and the joiner plane. And most new woodworkers probably wouldn't have a joiner plane. Uh, as you notice, these two are metal bodied and this is wood bodied. And the oldest planes are all wood bodied. You can still buy wood bodied planes such as this one right here, although this is an old one, okay? Um, the joiner plane is used when you're trying to joint a board, just like joining it on a, on a jointer or on a table saw. You're trying to get that straight edge that you can edge glue together. Okay, and this is the way it was done before we had table saws and jointers to do it. The bench plane is your common use plane. The block plane is used for predominantly cutting end grain, although it's a handy plane because of its small size for all sorts of different things. If you notice, if we put these two planes side by side, there's a huge difference in the blade angle. This is at about 40, 45 degrees. This is about 25 degrees. And why, the, that, why that's done is, is that that sharper angle means that it cuts through the end grain much easier, okay? So let's take a look at the parts in our, our jack plane here. Of course, we've got a shoe, the base of it. And I'm going to pop this apart. Okay, there's a mouth in the shoe, and that's where the blade sticks through. And this metal piece here is called the frog, and its purpose is to support the blade, okay? Uh, and it, it can be adjusted as to its position, but that's kind of like the thing you adjust it once to match the blade, and you leave it that way, all right? The blade here, this part is the blade, and it's ground. To, to give us an angle, but there's also here a piece of metal that's attached to it. It almost looks like it's there for a stiffener, but its main purpose is to be a chip breaker. And what I mean is, is that the long curling chips that come off of the plane, this helps to, to, them to break so that they make those curls, okay? It should be set back from the edge of the plane a little bit. I've got it about a sixteenth of an inch here. Uh, different people do that different ways, and you can vary that considerably depending on personal preference, a 16 seems to work pretty well. So this will sit on top of the frog and there's a screw here that, that holds it in place. And then we have here the cap and the cap has a lever and what this does is this clamps it all together. Now the reason we have a screw here is, is that we may have to adjust that to get our, our cap to put enough pressure on the blade to hold it tight, snugly. Okay? If it doesn't hold it snugly then that has to be adjusted. Now there's two important adjustments on the plane, and that is this knob under here, and this adjusts how much of that blade sticks out the bottom. And then there's this lever here, and this is for side to side. So before we use a plane, what we want to do is we want to adjust our plane, adjust our, our knob down. This knob down here is I'm trying to get just a little bit of the blade sticking out. Now, how much you get depends on the cutting you're doing, how hard the wood is you're working, 
uh, a lot of different factors, including personal preference, okay? I usually go for a pretty thin cut, and I always have trouble setting my plane up, mostly because I don't use it as often as I should. Now, once I get a, a little bit of a blade extended, what I'm looking for next thing is, is the blade sticking out the same amount on this side as on this side, okay? And what I can see looking at this, that this is sticking out a little more than this. So what I would do is I would take this lever back here that I mentioned to you, and I would adjust that lever to change the angle of my blade slightly, there we go, to even that up so that my chip will be even. Otherwise, say I'm, I'm cutting the edge of a board, I'll be cutting more off of one side than the other, and then rather than getting it flat and perpendicular to the faces, I would gradually tilt it, okay? And the more cuts I make, the more tilt we get. So that's the basic setup of the plane. Now, when you get a new plane, there's something else you really need to do, and that's to take it apart, and you need to flatten the shoe. So all I've done is taken the blade out, and I've got a shoe here. This is cast, and it's been ground at the factory, but it's probably not perfect. So what you want to do is take a pencil, draw a squiggle on it so you can see what areas you've, you've ground, and then you want to put down a piece of sandpaper, or preferably emery paper, and you will rub it on there, and it'll take a while, I'll warn you that right now, until you get to the point where you can see that you've rubbed some material off all the way. Now typically when you get that plane, what you'll find is the edges and, and maybe right around this mouth will be high as compared to the rest of the shoe. You want to get it so it's all flat. If it's not all flat, that is going to affect how it cuts and how, how clean your cut comes out. Now that doesn't matter if we're talking about a jack plane or we're talking about a, a pretty much any sort of plane, okay? The jointer plane, this jointer plane, I've done the same thing on it as well. I showed you how to adjust a metal body plane, but what about a wood body plane? Now, wood play planes are actually the old way of doing things, and, and you wouldn't expect it, but they're actually still in use today. Uh, a couple different ways. One, you can buy new woods, and the other is, is a lot of people will buy antique ones and refurbish them. Uh, Japanese planes are actually wood bodied as well, and they differ from Ours, in that ours are designed to cut on the push stroke and theirs are designed to cut on the pull stroke, okay? Uh, kind of like the difference between our saws. All right, so here's a, a wood body plane. This is a relatively new wood body plane, uh, relatively new meaning it's like 20 years old. Um, I bought this and I bought it because I, I wanted a rabbiting plane, uh, not, and I don't do a lot of rabbiting. The, so I was trying to find a decent wood uh, rabbiting plane that would be not be so expensive. The one I originally was looking at was metal body, and it was about 150 bucks. This wood body one, which was made in Germany, was 39.95. I chose the 39.95. Now it is a little different to work with. One, you don't have handles. The body of the plane itself becomes your handles. You put one hand behind to push, and the other on top to hold it down and to help control. Uh, but you also have a different way of setting the blade height. There's no adjustment knob there. If you look at this particular plane, what you'll see is you'll see this tang from the blade sticking up past this wedge. And that's uh, w one of the secrets to being able to adjust the blade depth or the depth of cut, okay? So if I want a deeper depth of cut, I just take a mallet and I give that a couple of wraps and that'll push the, the blade out more. And that little light tap I did just pushed the blade out more. I can feel it. All right, what if I need to I'd retract it? I've got too much of a cut and I want to cut it back. There's, you strike the back end. This, this plane has a, a metal button here for that purpose. They don't always have that, but that's what it's there for. And a couple wraps on the back end of that, and that causes the blade to retract some, so I can adjust the depth of cut. Same thing with these. Now, these are molding planes, they're antiques. And as I said, some people will buy these things and refurbish them. I haven't refurbished these. This particular one is for cutting a radius on the edge of a piece. This one is cutting for a cutting a, um, a groove such as for putting in a drawer bottom. Uh, they're useful. If I bothered to refurbish them, I could go ahead and use them, but I just haven't done so. Okay, so let's talk about actually cutting with the plane, okay, and using the plane to do something. Now, one of the key things when using any plane is you have to understand the grain direction, all right? Uh, if we take any board, uh, we, the, we obviously have the long grain, and it's running pretty much parallel with the length of the board but it will normally wander off a little to one side or the other. And that's really important that we understand that and that we see that in the wood. If we look at this piece of wood and we look at this particular line in the grain, it's 
the distance here is greater than here. So that tells me that the, the grain is angling up a little bit this way. That's what I want because I'm going to be cutting in this direction. If I was cutting in the opposite direction, what would happen is that the blade would tend to separate the fibers and cause splintering. We don't want to do that. We want to cut the fibers, okay? So this is a, a, a good, pretty good sample piece that we'll use to work with uh, to how, how we use the plane, all right? Now, some wood is problematic, especially pine. If we look at this piece of pine right here, it's got a couple knot holes in it. And what that does is it causes that the grain is angling up here and then down after this knot hole and then up after the before this knot hole and then down again, okay? And that's pretty typical with pine because the 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 wood grain, which is we're talking the long direction of the pole is or the vertical direction in the tree as it's growing, has to go around those knot holes or it has to grow around those knot holes. And that's how it does. It just kind of compresses the grain. Uh, but it causes us some real problems when it comes trying to work that wood. So you know, go ahead and chuck this up in this little device. It's going to be a little tricky for me to work this way, so if I look awkward, don't be surprised, okay? So I'm, I'm going to start off with my, my bench plane or jack plane here. And uh, you always use two hands with the plane. Uh, I'm going to start off first with putting the pressure here on the front end so that um, I'm holding the shoe of the plane flush up against the board, okay? As I start the cut and as I get into the cut, I'm going to be tra transferring the pressure so it's the, the back here that I'm putting the pressure so that by the time I get to the end, all of my pressure is in the back and I'm still maintaining that pressure. If the pressure was in the front, it would tend to tip forward, all right? So you don't want to cut off a huge cut. You just want to barely cut a little bit. Um, this is one of the problems that new people that are new with planes have is they tend to try and cut off too much. In Japan, they actually have competitions who can cut the thinnest shaving, okay, with a plane. And we're talking like 30-foot long shavings. It's amazing what they do. Uh, they're obviously more skilled than I am, or at least the people in that competition are. So what I'm doing is starting from the back and working my way to the front, and I cut off absolutely no material. What does that tell me? It tells me that my blade is not sticking out enough. All right, so let's see if we can adjust that a little bit. Come on. Okay, so now I've got sticking out farther, and we'll see how that does. Now, don't be surprised when you first start planing a board if you don't have a chip going the entire length. The reason for that is, is that the board is uneven, okay? And you're trying to even it up. So in the process of trying to even it up, yeah, you can expect that you're going to be, you're going to be hitting some spots and not other spots, all right? But as you continue, you should be getting a much more consistent chip coming off that board. And that's what we want right there, okay? So the one thing you really got to watch out for, and this is the, probably the hardest part of using a plane, is keeping the plane level. You don't want to tip it either way. You want to make sure that this surface is perpendicular to this surface. And that's part of the reason you're planing it. If you're going to do an edge-glued panel and you're trying to clean up the edge because maybe your table saw uh, left too many saw marks there and it's not good for gluing, so you're just trying to clean it up, you want to make sure you keep it perpendicular while you're doing it, okay? Uh, likewise, uh, pretty much anything, you want to keep it perpendicular. And so it's, it's a lot about controlling the way you're, you're, you're holding the plane. And I'll have to say, when you're standing over it and in line with it, it's a whole lot easier than what I'm doing right now. Okay, so that's that's cutting the long grain. Now, what about cross cutting? Okay, and uh, yes, we cross cut with a, a plane at times. That's really what we use a uh, a block plane for. It's really what it's designed for. Although there's other ways you can use the block plane. So we'll we'll put this piece in here. I'm not sure how well this is going to work. So here's my block plane. Now the block plane has a shallower angle so we can cut several of those, those uh, fibers when we're doing cross grain. Now, one of the things you want to do using a block plane is you want to hold your blade kind of at an angle. You don't want to go square on as you're trying to cut it. And again, pine is really hard to work with because the pine will tend to, because it's so soft, the, the fibers will compress and, and tend to tear, uh, I'd actually be better off trying to cut a piece of maple than I am doing this pine. 
But this is where, where the block plane is, is really shines. Now it's not the only place you might use a block plane. There's a lot of people that like using block planes for just general uh, cutting. Let's say you want to put a chamfer on, and you don't have a chamfer plane. Well, you can do that with a jack plane, but it's a whole lot easier to do that with a block plane. Okay, it's, it's lighter weight, it's easier to control, and you can very easily put a chamfer onto that board. Uh, if you've ever done a, a uh, round over um, with a, a router and you're trying to put a curved edge on a piece and it turns out, you know, you get that little line, you, oh no, I got the bit set a little too high, now I've ruined it, right? Wrong. Take your, your block plane and just clean that up. Okay, you can do that very easily with a block plane just by cutting right there where that line is and just kind of extend your radius a little bit. So a lot of places like that where a block plane can be extremely useful. One other kind of plane I want to show you is a modern uh, molding plane. And the wood planes I had out a little while ago they were, were molding planes, they were antique molding planes. This is a modern one. This is actually a very inexpensive version of a modern molding plane. Now you can get really nice uh, modern molding planes that do all kinds of things. Uh, Stanley makes some incredible ones. But this is a, a simplified one. And it actually works fairly decent for doing edges, like if you want to do a round over, if you want to do a chamfer. And it comes with a, a bunch of different bits that can go in the same tool for, for cutting. Um, one of the things you got to know about using a tool like this is, is that you don't want to try and cut off too much material at one time. The temptation is to set the blade height so that you're doing these massive cuts. And just like with the block or with the, the jack plane, it doesn't work well. So here I've got a, a radiusing bit in here, and I've just set it to do just a little tiny bit of a cut. Now I'm going to adjust it a little bit deeper. And you go in stages. Now this, this is different than working with the other planes in that you're actually adjusting your blade depth as you go. And I'm adjusting the blade depth because the, this V is, is fixed. But what I'm trying to do is adjust the amount of cut I'm getting, out of the depth of cut to make a bigger radius. This does a really clean job, uh, and it's very, very quick. You know, if you just have a little bit of, of wood that you need to do a radius on, I'll, I'll, I'll say that this is much faster than setting up that radius bit in the router. Now, I took a little too big a chunk at that, on that last one there, but it still worked. Okay, and so you can set up for a radius, you can set up for a chamfer, there's a couple of more decorative bits in it. And this is a, again, there are times when this is practical and there's times when it'd be more practical to use your, your router table. Set up the router table when you've got to do a lot of stuff. But if you just got a, one piece that you've got to do a, a radius on or a chamfer on, this is a whole lot easier. And it's a, an inexpensive tool. You should never assume that a plane's blade is sharp when you buy it. Now the plane uh, blade will have been ground at the manufacturer, but there's a difference between ground and sharp, okay? And so you have to take the plane apart and sharpen it. Now you should always sharpen with a jig, and there's a number of different kinds of jigs around. This is a fairly simple and fairly common design, and it clamps on the sides of the blade, and the purpose of it is to hold that blade at a consistent angle. Now, if you buy one of these, this one's powder coated. I recommend avoiding the powder coated ones because it doesn't grip as well, okay? Uh, you'll also want to, whenever you use one of these, make sure that you would go more than finger tight and tighten it with a screwdriver. And so the idea here is that it's holding the blade at a consistent angle while I rub it over the stone. You notice I didn't rub it very hard because I haven't set the angle. Now, I have this other jig here. It's a little fancier setup. And uh, basically, uh, the whole idea here is the same thing, hold that blade at a consistent angle. So I'm going to put my blade in here, and I need to get down at a height where I can eyeball it. Now, what, what some people will do is make themselves a, uh, a block so that they can actually set this angle with the block by, by running the the blade into the block and that's a great idea I've just never gotten around to doing it I still eyeball it every time I use it so with that tight 
my blade is being held at a very consistent angle, okay? So now I can make sure my blade is perpendicular and there's lines on here to help me with that. Tighten the clamp down. Okay, so now I've, I've got my blade in here and this is the, the coarser side of my stone. All, all stones have a coarser and a finer side. I'm actually using, uh, I'm not using a super fine stone here. Uh, different people will tell you different things about how fine a stone you, you need. Real uh, sharpening aficionados will tell you that you need something that's, say it goes, you'll need several stones going up to 6,000 grit. I have found for most woodworking purposes a stone that say uh, 300 and 1600 does, the bit, uh, does what you need. So this is 300 grit on this side, it's 600 on the other side. So what I'm going to do is, is hold the blade down with a couple of fingers and I'm putting pressure as I go forward and then releasing pressure to come back. Okay, so now I've done a little bit. Now I'm going to, to move my blade to allow it to, to come down a little more. Um, and again, do it some more. One of the nice things I like about this particular jig is that I can loosen my blade up and even take it out and I maintain my angle there, okay? When you look at the blade, what you're looking for is you're looking to see, are you getting a flat surface, okay? You want from the, the very point of the blade to the, the back, the thickest part here, to all end up absolutely flat and even, okay? Get a little more oil to my stone. Obviously, the sharper your blade, the better it's going to cut, okay? So, so once you get all the way down, then we would take the stone and flip the stone over and do the exact same thing on the finer side. And, and if you so desire that you want to go to, to even finer grades, finer grits, okay, then after this stone, you would replace it and put in another stone. And that's, again, I said, like I said, there's a lot of people that like, like to do that. They believe you need to go as far as 6,000 grit. I, I normally don't do that. I figure if a blade is sharp enough to cut paper, it's sharp enough to cut wood. So that's the, the honing process when you're using a jig. Now, you really don't want to do this freehand because it's extremely hard to hold that angle consistent. And you're not going to get a good grind if you don't do it consistently. Now, once you've got your blade ground uh, for, for subsequent sharpening, what a lot of people do is they'll, you do what's called a micro bevel. If you take a look at this diagram, you'll see that I've got my main bevel there, and then there's a, a bevel that's a slightly different angle just down at the very, very edge. And what that's doing is that's a easier way of resharpening. And you can micro bevel several times sharpening your, your blade, uh, without having to go through a full sharpening. And then after you've done it several times, you go back and you do a full sharpening again. There's one last tool I want to talk to you about, and that's the humble square. Yeah, I know you probably think you know how to use a square, but there's just one thing I want to talk about that maybe you're unaware of, and that is, do you know that your square is square? Now, it may seem like a silly question, but I have found that squares aren't always square. And when you buy a square, one of the first things you need to do is to make sure this, the, that the square is square. So. Here's a, a typical tri-square that I bought at our favorite store, Amazon. And uh, if you look at this square really close, there's a, uh, an Allen hex head here on this screw. And the reason that that exists is because it's actually possible to adjust the square. Now, how do you know that the square is square? Well, you start off by comparing it to a known square surface. And, and that's how things go in the measurement world. If you wanna check for accuracy, and I'm talking about even in industry where you need extreme accuracy, you always compare tools to a known good source, okay? For our purposes, a known good source would be like a machinist square. I think everybody needs to have one small machinist square in their shop that is their standard that they use. And, uh, this wasn't really all that expensive, 20 some dollars, something like that. Uh, I use it, I don't just use it as a standard. But now, now I can take that square and I can put that up to my tri-square here and find out for sure whether or not my tri-square is square. And if not, then I can go ahead and make adjustments to my tri-square. Well, okay, in this case, well, it looks like we're in pretty good shape, so I don't need to adjust it. Well, 
Now, what about a framing square? Now, actually, of all types of squares, I have found framing squares to be the biggest offenders when it comes to being square or being, I should say, out of square. All right. Well, it's a little ridiculous to take this little uh, machinist square and use it to compare with this big framing square, although, it, yeah, it can be done. But since I've already checked my tri-square with the machinist square, I know this is square, I can use this now to check my framing square. All right, so what do I do if I find out my framing square is out of adjustment? It's not square. It doesn't have a set screw where I can adjust it. Well, I, that actually happened with this square. And what you do is, is you draw yourself a line from the inside corner to outside corner. All right, and then take a center punch and dimple it along that line. Now, if you need to spread it, you dimple it on the inside of the corner. If you need to compress it, make the angle a little more acute, you do it on the outside. And you do it from both sides. In doing that, you can actually make that square square. Okay, so what do you do if you don't have that known good square to use as a point of comparison? Well, you can take any board and use it to check your square. Just as long as you got a straight edge on that board. And I know I've got a straight edge on this piece of particle board because it sits flat on my workbench. There's no light shining through. It's not wobbling. We're good. All right. So I'm going to take my tri-square here and I'm going to prove that my tri-square is square. And I'm going to do it by putting it up against the side of this, this piece of wood. Make sure I've got it up solidly there and draw a line, the longest line I can. Then I'm going to flip it over the other way. So now I've got my, my reference leg in the opposite direction. Bring it right up to that same point and draw the line again. Now, if my square is square, that should be one line. Not only should it be one line, but it shouldn't get wider at one end than it is the other end. If it gets wider at one end or the other, or I see them diverging or in any way, shape, or form, that tells me my square is out of square. But as it turns out, I've already done this before, so yeah, my square is actually square. Next tool I'd like to talk about is the marking gauge. Now, the marking gauge may be something you've never seen or you've seen, you didn't know what it was. This is here a marking gauge, uh, and this is also a marking gauge. This is a commercial one, and this is actually the most common style out there, this round one. It's easy to work with. This is a, a wood one that I made myself, and uh, uh, it does the same exact job. It's just maybe a little harder to work with, okay? So why would I need a marking gauge? I mean, we're all used to using a pencil, right? Well, pencils are great, but sometimes pencils aren't perfect and especially in cases when we really need to get an exact dimension. The problem with trying to use a pencil and get an exact dimension is that maybe our reference that we're using, you know, a ruler or our square, moves. It can happen, okay? The other thing that's a problem with a pencil is the thickness of the pencil point, whether it's a mechanical pencil like I use or it's a a uh, pencil, or just a regular pencil, and you sharpen it. If you don't get a really, really sharp point, your line might end up a little bit off from where your ruler is. Okay, well, that doesn't happen with a marking gauge. So, so what's so special about a marking gauge? What this does is this scores or cuts a, a very thin line exactly where you want. Now, you can set it using this thumb screw, and you can go from you know, almost nothing. This one will go up to about six inches, and they make different sizes, but most of the work you do is in that first inch, actually. And this would be really important when you're doing dovetail joinery, uh, especially hand cut dovetail joinery, hand cut box joints or finger joints, uh, tenons, hand cut tenons, anything like that. You would want to be able to get the line from the edge of your board where you need to cut, okay? And we would do that actually not by using the scale that's built into this, although it has one, but by taking it and comparing it to another part, okay? Uh, I may have, like if I'm doing dovetails, and I would take it and compare, set this up using the thickness of the wood, okay? I'm using two pieces of wood, they're the same kind of wood, they're the same thickness, and I would set this so that my, my disc here, the sharp edge of my disc is right on that edge with the, the flat plate up against the other side here, okay? Now what I can do is I can draw, I can use this to, to scribe a line, and I realize you're not gonna be able to see this line on camera, um, but I'm scribing a line here, and essentially I'm, I'm cutting this uh, just through the surface, and that line is exactly 
that distance of the thickness of this wood. And that's what this is useful for. So now if I was doing a dovetail joint, I could go ahead and use my dovetail square to do, draw my angles, but I know exactly how deep it's going to be. Same thing if I'm trying to do a tenon. If I'm trying to cut a tenon, you know, obviously it might be a little deeper than that, but I know exactly where the shoulder of that tenon needs to be. So for joinery, for hand cut joinery of any sort that's, that we want to be extremely accurate, uh, any of the types I've already mentioned, this is a very critical tool because this is what's going to give you the accuracy of depth. Right? Can you do that with a, a, a square or a ruler and a pencil? Yeah, but you're not going to get it as accurate. That's the real key. This gives you the accuracy. So it's not a very expensive tool. Uh, I think I paid $13 for this one. Uh, there's a, and this is a pretty nice one. It's, it's brass. Uh, yeah, you can find them. The prices will range greatly. But because of the way that they're designed, a cheap one is going to work as good as an expensive one, okay? Uh, likewise, this will work just as well, uh, but again, this is the more common style.